Hello everybody. My name is Ramona Koval and uh, I'm a writer, a former journalist. I'm here because my daughter Sarah is uh, on the board of Reprieve and she knows that I used to be a broadcaster so I can wrangle people with microphones. Um, that's my job tonight. Um, welcome to this gathering for Reprieve Australia which as you probably know is an organisation that is a member of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty and arranges for volunteer lawyers and interns to provide legal and humanitarian assistance to activists, lawyers and prisoners on death row. Here in Australia, Reprieve campaigns and conducts research to raise awareness of issues concerning the death penalty and ensures local and international partners are equipped with the best support and the latest information. Before we begin, I must thank Monash University, Monash Law specifically, for hosting, catering and organising this event in this terrific venue. And thanks also to the Dean of the Law School, Professor Brian Horrigan, for his ongoing support of Reprieve Australia. I should also say that Julian McMahon is an alumnus of Monash Law, so you should feel very proud of him. This is what's going to happen this evening. Um, we're going to have the privilege of hearing a conversation between these three lawyers who have spent years in the noble, difficult, harrowing occupation of defending prisoners on death row in a variety of jurisdictions. Um, they're going to, to speak with each other for about half an hour. Then there'll be time for you to ask through me some questions of our guests. There's going to be um, some mics available to you. You're not allowed to speak until you have a mic under your nose. Doesn't matter how terrific you think you are at um, addressing the court without a microphone or how deep your voice is, it's not going to cut it. You have to have a mic. Um, I will um, start to creep towards this stage when it's time for the Q&A and Julian, who's not concentrating, uh, <laughs> will then um, hand it over to, to you. Um, so let's begin. Uh, as I said, chairing the conversation tonight is Julian McMahon, the President of Reprieve Australia and as you know, a Melbourne barrister working in criminal law, typically in homicide and terrorist matters. In 2002, he was briefed in the matter of Van Tuong Nguyen, a young Australian arrested in Singapore carrying heroin from Vietnam to Australia. Van was executed in 2005. Since that case, Julian has been working on death penalty cases and related issues. He was part of the team who defended Australians Andrew Chan and Myran Sukumaran, executed in Indonesia on the 29th of April 2015. Our international guests are Parvez Jabbar and Saul Leofreund, the co-founders and co-executive directors of the Death Penalty Project, a legal action charity based at the London law firm Simons, Muirhead and Burton. They specialise in representing prisoners sentenced to death at the appellate level in both criminal and constitutional proceedings before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council and local courts of appeal, as well as bringing cases before international tribunals and courts, including the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the Inter-American Court um, of Human Rights, and the United Nations Human Rights Committee. They've lectured and conducted working seminars on capital punishment issues to a wide range of audiences, including members of the judiciary, legal profession, parliamentarians and the diplomatic community. Uh, Parvez and Saul are world experts in their field and it's a great privilege to be able to hear them tonight. Please welcome Julian and Parvez and Saul. Thank you. Uh, Ramona, am I meant to use this microphone now? Yes. At all times, okay. I was paying attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ramona. Um, I'd like to start by um, remembering and acknowledging the people, the Wurundjeri people on whose land we are, and to remember that grand heritage and to pay our respects to their elders past and present. Uh, I'd also like to start again by uh, giving my sincerest thanks to Monash University. Uh, I wrote to the Dean some time ago and said, I have these two guests coming 
from London to do a few things for us and I would think that they should come to your university and speak to the students because honestly it would be such a waste if they were here and did not speak to your students. Your students will be inspired and the reply email said, okay, well that's a given. Um, now, we'd also like to host a function for you for the law profession uh, at the Monash City Chamber. So the reason we're all here tonight is because of that spontaneous uh, generosity from the Monash Law Faculty and so I'm obviously very sincerely grateful for that. Um, I was trying to remember spontaneously last night how it is that I first arranged for them to be here and I actually honestly can't remember. Uh, Megan Tittensaw is somewhere in here, barrister, and um, it's at least eight or nine years ago that she was in the office of these two guests in London and some time ago over a number of conversations they made the offer, well look if we can ever help you. And uh, somehow I turned that into uncharacteristically forcefully from me I think uh, yes well we want you to come and visit in Australia and talk to people uh, and the next thing you know that was arranged and here we are and we're um, talking to people in a number of cities over uh, three or four days around Australia uh, tonight is uh, very special to me um, because I'm looking out at so many uh, people in the law profession who I know and from other parts of society who at different times in the last 10 years or so have given very um, warm words of um, support to uh, the various people working on the cases that many of you know so much about. Um, so I'm very uh, grateful and pleased to see so many of you here. Uh, my primary objective tonight is that you are all glad that you came and I'm pretty confident that you will be apart from whatever I say but putting that aside I think you'll be glad that you came because uh, many of us know each other and we know that we're in a serious business and I've learned over the last uh, five or so years um, that uh, around the world doing death penalty work there's this organization called the death penalty project and I gradually learned about that and I gradually got to meet these guys and I've been to their office and we've talked in numerous countries around the world at different times. And you wouldn't know it from your first or third meeting, but it turns out that um, when you know enough about their work, they are uh, either alone or with one or two others, um, the most effective legal team in the world fighting the death penalty. And if you hear some of their story tonight from the Caribbean uh, through um, many cases from those countries in the Caribbean, through Asia, through North Africa, you'll realise that there are, um, I'm not sure how many, I'm not sure if they know how many, but we're talking thousands, not hundreds of people who have not been executed directly because of their work rather than indirectly. And then there's all the other people who have been indirectly, not subsequently sentenced to death. So it's an amazing story. And uh, since we are talking to a room mostly full of lawyers, some of the things that they've achieved would include uh, the abolition of the mandatory death penalty in at least a dozen countries uh, by running cases. Uh, so judges, instead of being obliged to sentence a prisoner to death, which was, for those of you who remember, the Van Nguyen story in Singapore, uh, that um, they run cases to the Privy Council usually, which has led to that law changing. Many of you know that uh, there's this idea floating around the jurisprudence around the world that if you spend too much time on death row, it becomes such a cruel thing that the sentence of death which has been imposed on you should be withdrawn because ultimately you're kind of being tortured, you're on death row for so long. In many countries that's called the five year rule and if you spend more than five years on death row it's almost a given that you should no longer stay on death row because it's too cruel to be on death row for that long. Insofar as you'll hear that rule and see countries around the, rule that, around the world that have it, it's much more likely than not it's because of cases that these guys have run. Um, 
there are countries in the world where you get sentenced to death and then the president or government will have the chance to grant mercy or review the decision. Uh, in some countries, for instance, cases that we know about, like Indonesia and Singapore, that's a mysterious and hidden process. Why the president of Indonesia or Singapore continues with the decision to execute or not is a mystery. What papers they read is unknown and so on. But there are other countries where that is now a reviewable decision. The, trans the process is transparent uh, and reviewable. And again, that's because of litigation that these guys have run. Uh, there are many other legal precedents that they've set, uh, but you don't really want to hear from me. In some, at least one country in the Caribbean, I'm not sure how many, uh, battered women syndrome is a defence to uh, murder uh, because of cases they've run. Uh, and we could just keep giving examples. So in addition to all that kind of work, they've driven research in, in, uh, in numerous countries around the world. So it's a fascinating story. Um, I think that many of us um, uh, would really have liked to hear this story about a week out of law school. I know I would have. And it would have saved me five years in a commercial law firm, amongst other things. Although I did like the people I was working with because we're being filmed. The, uh, <laughs> but um, so from China, through Asia, through the Americas, the Caribbean, Africa, you can hear stories from these guys. So it's a remarkable career. Uh, and now that's enough for me. My job now is to try and ask uh, leading questions which lead them to chat. Uh, can that person speak up? So uh, as to where to begin on this conversation, um, as you would have realised, almost everyone here is a lawyer or passing themselves off as a lawyer. Uh, so. Uh, so obviously, most of us are criminal lawyers, so we don't want to hear anything about the law. We want stories. Uh, I thought maybe we could start with Uganda, uh, because I know from reading material and, and talking to you that uh, when you went to Uganda, you were facing an enormous problem. You made uh, what you have previously described as an error in the way you spoke to your huge number of clients. So that's the kind of country we like to hear about. So perhaps you could tell us that story. You have to turn your microphone on. Okay. Uh, um, maybe I just I go a little bit forward because I can't see um, these people here. Um, thank you very much for the invitation today to, to speak. Um, you will have gathered from what Julian has said that we're obviously doing some kind of a tour, um, saying speaking about the same thing. So each day we're getting better and better at it. So... Um, Uganda was um, a very uh, moving moment for us. Um, Julian has described really some of the constitutional work that we've been involved in, in looking to restrict the scope and application of the death penalty all around the world. As a result of the work that we did in the Commonwealth Caribbean, um, we were contacted by lawyers in Uganda. We'd never worked in Africa before. This was about... 10, 12 years ago, and um, I received an email from some lawyers in Uganda in Kampala, and they said, we have been working on a death penalty case, and we've been doing research, and we're reading all of these judgments from uh, many parts of the world, and we keep seeing your name, as in the law firm, in the law reports. Um, we want to bring a challenge to the death penalty in Uganda. Will you come and help us? That's all it said. And um, we have this philosophy um, or principle, um, that we never say no to an invitation. Um, so we replied and we said, um, I'm sure we'll, we can help. Let's send us some papers. Let's have a look. And then we got the papers and we have this other principle, which is in any work that we do, we will always go and visit that location. So we said, right, what we must do is get on a flight and go to Uganda. So we flew out to Uganda, um, went to Kampala, and on the day that we arrived, we, we were welcomed and so on, and they said, we, we need to go to the prison. We need to meet the clients. It just so happened that it was, in fact, a class action 
So they were representing 417 prisoners on death row, and they wanted to bring a challenge to the death penalty per se, and other aspects such as the mandatory delay and so on. So they said, let's go to, let's go to the prison. So we went to the prison, not knowing what to expect. And as we parked up and we were walking through the prison gates, we could hear all this singing and chanting. We weren't quite sure what it was. It was sort of distant, but we could hear it quite easily. We walk into the prison, into the main compound, and in front of us, in the main concourse, so to speak, were 417, I assume 417, prisoners who were part of this legal action. And they were singing this beautiful African song to us. And I, I remember vividly, we called it, we, we described it as one of our most moving moments, really, in the work that we've been doing over the last 25 years, of the, all these prisoners in pristine, clean, white, sort of ironed, Hyatt sort of, you know, um, iron clothing, looked immaculate, and they were singing this song and welcoming, uh, welcoming us. And then the lawyer said to us, he said, you need to say something to these people, but you need to say something positive. <laughs> and we're looking as lawyers and we're thinking, well, we, we can bring a good case here, but as lawyers, we would never ever say to our clients, we will definitely win, as you know. But something in us, um, maybe it was panic, I don't know. But we all got up. There were three of us at, um, at this from, from England. We all got up and we said, um, very nice to meet you. Thank you for this welcome. We will win this case and you will have justice in your matter. And then we remember Julian coming out of that and thinking, it's been recorded, so I better not swear. But we effectively said, what the hell did we just say there? So to cut a long story short, we went to court, we went before the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court, and we didn't win on death penalty per se, but we abolished the mandatory death penalty, and we got a ruling on the issue of delay, which, following the, the case that Julian mentioned, said that anybody on death row for more than three years after your appeal um, ought to be commuted. By the time we finished the case, there were in fact 950 prisoners on death row. So, as a result of that one case, 950 individuals were resentenced. Um, there has been no executions in Uganda since 2005, and the judges, as Julian has said, have really, in applying discretion, never felt that the death penalty was an appropriate punishment. So for us, it was a fantastic case, um, a good win, but it was also one of the most moving moments we've ever had. Actually, I look forward to winning a case with 950 clients. <laughs> This is apropos of nothing. One of my friends has this joke that whenever he hears that someone is being represented by me, he just says, oh my God, I pity that person. They're going to lose, they're going to die. But <laughs> we have black humour. I guess maybe some of you are not used to that, but anyway. Uh, just while we're in Africa, um, if you haven't realised yet, you'll realise in the next minute, this is totally, it's unscripted. We're just talking about what we know. So. I don't know what the answers are going to be, but I know, for instance, that in Kenya, there were something like 4,000 people on death row. Now, did you have a role to play in Kenya? Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm the other one. Um, <laughs> he's the other one. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we have played a role in Kenya. Um, we've been bringing similar litigation in Kenya to the litigation we brought in Uganda. Um, what's been so interesting about our work is one country, one big judgment, especially in constitutional law, leads to another country, another opportunity to bring a similar challenge. Um, and the courts in Kenya um, have been receptive to challenges to aspects of the death penalty, in particular the mandatory death penalty. Um, in Kenya, it's not just a mandatory death penalty for the offence of murder. They also have a mandatory death penalty for the offence of capital robbery. Um, and capital robbery is effectively a simple robbery of something like a mobile phone. But what turns it from a simple robbery to a capital robbery is some aggravating features, um, namely more than one person participating in the crime um, or carrying an offensive weapon, a dangerous weapon, but not necessarily using that weapon. Um, now, this has resulted in thousands of people being sentenced to death for 
um, petty crime, stealing mobile phones, and the sentence is mandatory, um, the cases are heard by magistrates, and people are automatically sentenced to death. But the oddity about Kenya is Kenya hasn't carried out executions for more than 30 years. So you have this failed policy of prisoners just being stacked up on death row um, until the president comes along every few years and commutes 4,000 prisoners or 6,000 prisoners. Um, and then these same prisoners then are serving life sentences, um, which in reality could be life sentences. Um, we were invited to appear before the Supreme Court of Kenya as experts, international experts, and at uh, the moment we're waiting judgment from the Supreme Court on the question of the mandatory death penalty. So, yeah, we are involved in Kenya. So, if you, if, what's the best possible outcome there? You're looking for a, a Supreme Court judgment which will say what? That the mandatory death penalty is unconstitutional. Um, I mean, the mandatory death, abolition of the mandatory death penalty is pretty much global. I mean, there are a few holdouts, Singapore, Malaysia, Ghana, Nigeria, are four countries that still have the mandatory death penalty, and Kenya. But nearly all other countries that retain the death penalty have moved away from mandatory, and the judiciary have discretion. And once the judges have discretion, you're in a far better place. Um, and it's, they have a choice. Um, it's not the only sentence. So did you two appear as witnesses or with counsel? As Did you have counsel acting for you or appear as witnesses? Um, uh, no, we appeared, um, we appeared as amicus in the case we were invited by the Supreme Court to really, um, two things. Uh, during that hearing, both the Attorney General and the DPP in Kenya accepted that the mandatory death penalty was unconstitutional. So the question was, and we, we think we cannot lose, but this is Kenya, and I'm, we actually abolished a mandatory death penalty in Kenya in 2010. But the Court of Appeal had abolished it, but they have this very odd system where a different panel of the Court of Appeal can hear the same matter, and a different panel um, decided in a different way two years later, um, which, you know, as lawyers, the idea that um, the same tier can overrule itself, so to speak, um, was very strange, and so they've reheard they've reheard the case, um, and they what they really want to do, I think, is they want to know what is the impact if we were to abolish the mandatory death penalty in Kenya, what will happen? What do we do? So what we, um, apart from the submissions on mandatory, is we tried to help them frame um, a system of dealing with potentially nine thousand prisoners who would fall to be resentenced. And in a country like Kenya, where the criminal justice system is very slow, um, it's going to be an impossible task. So what we tried to do was talk about what had happened in other jurisdictions. And there are, def you know, there are different models on how um, countries sen sentence. We're not big fans of the American balance of aggravating and mitigating circumstances. What we have tried to um, promote is a, a, a discretion where the death penalty is implied in the very, very rare of rare cases, uh, so to limit it as much as we can. And um, so what we're really trying to do is find, help them find a solution if they go that route to make sure um, everybody gets justice. So uh, you two have been doing this work for 25 years and uh, it probably goes without saying that in the first year or two you didn't have a 25 year plan uh, we, we might talk about that a bit later, but if you can just sort of rise above and look down from a bird's eye view at the Caribbean over 25 years, uh, you really started because Caribbean cases were coming into the uh, commercial law firm that you worked in in London and there were good partners there who said, well, we're going to handle this anyway. We'll find a couple of young lawyers and that was you guys. Tell us about the Caribbean 25 years ago and today and what it looked like then and what it looks like now in terms of uh, killing prisoners, executing prisoners. Okay, so the, the baseline in the Caribbean 25 years ago, um, we'll just choose one country, so Jamaica. So in Jamaica 25 years ago, there were almost 300 prisoners on death row. Um, they were housed in appalling prison conditions, um, held in solitary confinement on death row in single cells, 
um, a slot bucket um, allowed out of their cell maybe for a few minutes every day to empty that bucket. No real visitors, definitely no lawyers going to see them. Um, and they were just stacked up on death row. The death penalty was mandatory, so the judges had no discretion and prisoners could be held for up to um, any period of time. There was no concept of the death row phenomenon um, or cruelty of keeping people on death row. Um, I can cut 25 years very short, and if you move forwards to today, um, there, today there's nobody on death row in Jamaica. The death penalty is discretionary. Judges have an option um, when it comes to sentencing. Um, the sentencing guidelines that we've helped to establish are such that the presumption is always life and not death, and the burdens on the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt um, that the case not only falls into the category of the rarest of the rare, um, but also that the individual is beyond hope of reformation. So a very, very restrictive test for the imposition of the death penalty. And on top of that, um, we have a ruling that says that you can't keep a prisoner on death row for more than five years. After five years, the carrying out of that sentence would become unconstitutional. So a combination of these strategic cases, these big constitutional cases, has dramatically restricted the death penalty down to the point that there's nobody on death row today. Julian, can I add something to that? Right. Which is that um, what we've effectively done is we've gone as far as we can legally through the courts. So the courts have restricted and limited the application of death penalty and what is now left are um, uh, um, countries in that region that have the death penalty, haven't executed for many, many years, have nobody on death row, but retain the death penalty on its statute books. And what is now missing, the big step, is getting political leadership to move forward from uh, where they were to where they are now and saying, maybe we should now rethink whether there's any point having the death penalty. We don't execute, we don't sentence anybody to death. But what is missing is that that dialogue and that sp the space is there, but there just isn't that engagement to say the natural next step is to abolish the death penalty. And that's something that we as lawyers can't do. It's something we try to do in other fora, in, in, in other ways in terms of dialogue, but the courts have done as much as they can do. It's probably worth just giving a quick example of why that matters. You might think, well, if the death penalty is abolished, pardon me, if the death penalty is not being used in a country, does it really matter whether it's abolished or not? So a good example would be Taiwan two years ago. You probably know that story. So there's quite a few people on death row in Taiwan. Exact, uh, two years ago in the middle of the year, a young child was terribly murdered. The community was fundamentally outraged at the nature of the killing. Uh, there was such outrage that the government was worried at the community um, reaction to the terrible crime. So six prisoners, or five or six, I can't remember now, were executed within a week, and none of them had anything in any way related to do to the, to the death of the young girl, but it was seen as a way of responding to community pressure. So when the law is there, and then it can be employed from time to time politically, uh, things can go wrong. It's one of the things that's going on in the Philippines now. Um, the, the Philippines has signed what's called the Second Optional Protocol to abolish the death penalty. Uh, they've already abolished the death penalty many years ago, twice in fact. And they've signed international instruments to enforce that. But the Constitution uh, still allegedly, on one reading, allows the law to be reintroduced. And that's what's happening in the Philippines today. We can just go back to Jamaica. Many of the people you're looking at here in this room have been to prisons somewhere in uh, Victoria and all the cells in the courts and so on. Uh, can you just paint us a picture of the reality of the conditions? I, 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 I paint image, I mean literally, tell us what it was really like in some of the uh, tougher prisons in the Caribbean when you'd go and meet clients for the first time on death row. I know one story you've told me is that um, uh, sometimes prisoners would struggle not to meet you because they thought they were being dragged out to be killed uh, because you had arrived. But just, just tell us what it's like, to, what those conditions can be like. Um, well, the, the prisons, I mean, we're not very proud of this. Prisons were built, built by the British um, during the colonial times. They, in the majority of countries, they were built for 
Um, a few hundred prisoners um, today, they house thousands of prisoners. Um, there are huge problems of overcrowding. Um, death row is different. It's meant to be, you're meant to be held in a single cell in solitary confinement. Um, obviously, when there are 300 death row prisoners, that's not possible. Um, but now that there are few death row prisoners in most countries, they are held in single cells. Um, we can take the Bahamas as a case in point. The Bahamas isn't one of the poorer Caribbean countries, but the prison in the Bahamas is particularly awful. Um, prisoners slop out. They're held in cells that are it's almost in the basement, so there's absolutely no natural light in the cells. So when we go and visit the clients, it takes a while to adjust. I mean, you're literally seeing people in the dark um, living in these very, very dark cells. And as I said before, um, there's no sanitation, uh, they slop out, um, very limited exercise and very few visits. Um, so as bad as they could be really, um, in terms of prison conditions. Uh, we might just jump over to Japan for a minute, talking about prison conditions. Um, if you could just briefly explain what happens in Japan. Uh, one of the things that interests us in the work that we hope to do and, and looking into the future is the strange phenomenon that many of the countries uh, with which Australia is very friendly nevertheless execute. Uh, so two obvious examples, three in that sentence would be Singapore, India and Japan. Very close to Australia in so many ways but nevertheless um, executing. Uh, but in Japan I think it would be fair to say the conditions in the prison cells for people on death row are truly extraordinary. Um, I'm pretty confident that most of you, most of you won't believe what you're about to hear uh, about those conditions in terms of movement, speech, any kind of um, normal human interaction. Uh, could you just talk about that um, perhaps for a minute, tell people? You were in Japan more recently than me, so... Um, well, the, the conditions in Japan, I mean, it's, the prisons are modern, so it's not about the physical conditions, that's one of the problems in the Caribbean. Um, in Japan, one of the um, problems about the death penalty is there is no notification of when a prisoner is to be executed. So every day a prisoner wakes up could be the last day, it could be the time that they're going to be executed. So. One of the problems is, is that after a while, and prisoners are held for a very long time on death row, um, and there are major problems about prisoners um, suffering from psychological problems, um, of not knowing um, their fate. Um, on top of that, there is no eye contact with prison guards. Um, they have to turn and face the wall when a prison guard enters their cell. Um, very, very limited visitation rights and contact with the outside world. So it's um, the, the system, it's not so much the physical conditions, but it's the actual treatment of the individuals um, is very troubling. And what about things like speaking and reading and entertainment? Do you know, like, can, you, can these prisoners on death row, can they have conversations with people? Can they read the books they want and so on? I mean, they're pretty leading questions there, aren't they? Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> so you, you, can be on a, you can be in a cell in Japan and you can, you, in, in many of the places, you're not actually allowed to move around either. You, you literally have to remain stationary for most of every day. Um, you, for most of the time, you're ne never allowed to have a conversation. Uh, every single day, you don't know whether it's going to be your last. So you've been there a week, a month, a year, a decade. Every single day, you wake up and you ask, is this the day that I'll be executed? But go ahead, for us. I mean, I was just going to add to say that we have brought a number of prison condition challenges or challenges to conditions of detention. And we're, the response we get from the governments in many of the jurisdictions that we operate is that you need to look at it from a cultural relative position, which is we try to adopt a sort of universal minimum standard. Everybody should be treated in this way. And what they say is, well, that's all very well, but we're a poor country. For example, we're working in Zimbabwe and you're more likely to die from starvation in Zimbabwe because of the economic problems in prison than because you're executed or any other. But So we're confronted with this issue about that's all very well in, in Europe, but here we are we're very poor 
and why should we waste money on the prisoners who are in prison rather, rather than the community? So that's been a very, very hard challenge. There have been some improvements. Um, in the past, we wouldn't get into prisons. They wouldn't let us see um, death row. That still happens in some places. In other places, for example, in Belize, um, it's being run now by um, a rotary club that has a very strong religious emphasis and they have taken over the contract of running the prison on the basis that um, they will run the prison if they don't have if they are not made to execute anybody they will not execute anyone so the government of belize doesn't have the funds so they're very happy to do this i, I have to say they've done an amazing job we visited them recently they've opened a rehabilitation unit um, and we actually we were invited to this rehabilitation unit to see what was happening um, and when we walked in um, the prison governor said to us, perhaps we can start off with a prayer. Pervez, would you like to start? I'm a complete atheist. So I had to get up and make, say this prayer and thank God for everything. So that was very, very odd. And then they started in the rehabilitation. They had this, the, is it the 12-step program? And they asked us to confess our, our addictions. So we found ourselves sort of basically saying, We've done terrible things, but you know we're we're at stage two, and they were all clapping. <laughs> they were all clapping, and it was so. We have the other principle we have is that we do whatever it, it takes to achieve what we're trying to achieve. Do it for the team. Thanks, Pervez. Uh, have, have you been running cases in Zimbabwe? What have you been doing in Zimbabwe? Well, um, we were originally invited by the, gov uh, the Swiss government uh, or the embassy, the Swiss embassy, to um, come out to, to Zimbabwe to consider whether there was any scope to move ab towards abolition. So Zimbabwe has now been 10 years since the last execution. They've Im implemented a new constitution which um, has gone from a mandatory death penalty um, and one of... Um, extenuating circumstances. That's, that was the principle they had, which was the death penalty was mandatory unless there were extenuating circumstances to one now of complete discretion. And the discretion is that where there are aggravating features, the death penalty can be imposed. So we were asked to go out there to see whether we can help Zimbabwe move towards abolition. So really what we did there was, it, we call it a scoping exercise, we sort of take the lie of the land and see where we can bring some legal reforms where we can work on empirical data and so on. So um, we were out there and clearly there's been a huge movement towards abolition. So what they've said is that they've applied all the principles that um, anyone over 70 can't be executed. They've applied the principle that any um, juvenile can't be executed. And they've added this other provision, which is women cannot be executed. Now, usually what happens in the jurisdictions in which we operate, women are sentenced to death but they're not executed because it's considered uncivilized. And I remember, actually, I think it was in Trinidad, we, we had this discussion about under the constitution that would be considered unequal and we should bring a challenge. And we sort of aired this as a potential possibility that it would be unequal and um, unfair and arbitrary to execute men if you don't execute women. And the very next day, there was an article in the front page of the newspaper from a very strong feminist group saying, we agree with you, you should execute women too. So it didn't have the kind of impact that we were, were looking for. So we, we slowly shelved that and put that back in the drawer. Um, but in Zimbabwe, where we are right now is that we think that we're very close to achieving abolition in Zimbabwe. What will really ha depend uh, or what will really um, impact will be what happens in the next election. And one of the issues is whether um, um, Mugabe um, continues to lead. The vice president, I should add, who is also the Minister of Justice, is totally opposed to the death penalty. So he is considered at this stage one of the potential um, new leaders. And the reason he is opposed to the death penalty in Zimbabwe is when he was young, when he was about 17, he spent uh, two years in prison and was potentially facing the death penalty. So I think the answer is, if you want to abolish the death penalty in a country, you need to get the ministers in prison on death row and they'll soon yeah, which actually has happened in, in quite a few countries um, you probably know the reason there are many countries in Africa which don't execute and so far as I can tell probably the main reason is because at the end of the apartheid era President de Klerk uh, probably soon after 
Nelson Mandela was released, announced a moratorium on the death penalty in about 1989. And then uh, with, I think, one exception, no one was executed till 1995 and the Constitutional Court gave a giant decision, which is one of the best decisions you'll ever read. Mukwan, it's hard to pronounce, Mukwan Yawe? Yep, Mukwan uh, And it's a fantastic decision and sort of principles we'd love to read. And I think that set the tone across Africa. It's a great decision. Uh, we haven't really talked much about Asia and I think we'd nearly have to go to Ramona for questions. Um, I guess I'm going to underline this question with a series of quick propositions. There are lots of injustices in the world and there's no reason to single out the death penalty as deserving more attention from us than many of those other injustices. You talk about sexual exploitation of children or slavery, you know, there are terrible things that happen in different places. But one of the things about the death penalty which makes it particularly interesting for lawyers to work on I think, uh, is that almost invariably where you find people being executed, you find a whole series of injustices and abuses of process. So when we pick up a case, we, as in anyone here, picks up a case uh, and you examine it to say, well, how come this client's about to be executed? Usually, if you go back to the beginning, there'll be a series of events which could include um, brutality at the time of arrest, uh, corruption at the time of arrest, um, a case that Matt Goldberg, who's was Matt here, Matt Goldberg worked on last year in Indonesia, uh, it seems almost certain that the, the client, well, some people say uh, it seems almost certain that the client was innocent at all times, but no real legal representation, a small amount of drugs and ultimately executed 12 months ago. So you've got, I'm not talking about Indonesia now, but where there's execution, you'll usually find brutality, uh, corruption, a failure of process and injustice at many levels. And when you fight the ultimate penalty in that case, you shine a light on all those other uh, process problems. And by winning the struggle or the debate about executing prisoners, you tend to improve or win the struggle about all these other important process arguments. Um, you could probably, we won't go into it now, I think you could probably say that's what's happening in China. Uh, China still is the world's largest executor, but far less now than it used to be. And its own internal reforms are about trying to better the processes, many of which are so poor, but some of which are improving. And the number of people being executed drops by the thousands as that happens. Um, so with that kind of introduction, I just want to ask about India, and then we'll go to Ramona. Um, I think your work in India tends to be more involved with um, working with people who are doing research. But perhaps if you could just talk about some of the results of the research from the New Delhi Law University that's come out in the last year or so, just in terms of the number of people being tortured prior to confession, their economic status, and their relationships with lawyers. Um, I know from conversations you've had cases where the lawyers um, know nothing about the case at which they are running. I think that would be pretty fair to say in some cases. Can you imagine doing that? Uh, but just to give us an idea about India and then we'll go to um, Ramon and some questions from the floor. Um, well, Julian's referring to a fantastic piece of research done by um, a very young team out of the National Law University in Delhi. And this research is available online and I'd commend it to anyone to read. Um, it's very long, but they have a nice short summary report. Um, but the, they, they carried out a socio-economic study of every single prisoner on death row in India. Um, and it's something we know anecdotally. We know that the people that we represent um, are invariably poor, marginalised, suffer from mental health problems, um, have not had um, equality in court, um, very poorly represented. We know this anecdotally through our cases, but we've never catalogued it um, in terms of analysing every single case and reporting on it. And the National Law University did exactly this. And it's a huge piece of work. Um, but the results are um, as expected, but when you read it, um, it's particularly shocking. So their findings are that 80% of the death row prisoners were tortured by the police. 
um, after their arrest. Um, nearly all of the prisoners complain about having appalling legal representation. So that's maybe not meeting their lawyers until the day of the trial, having no opportunity to give instructions. Um, the list goes on and on. Not speaking the language? Um, not even able, exactly, not even able to speak the dialect or the language that their lawyers can understand. Um, so effectively having no legal representation. So when you read this report, you quite quickly realise that the people who are on death row um, are victims in so many different ways. They're societal victims. And ultimately that is what the death penalty represents in so many parts of the world where we operate. Um, it's not necessarily just the wicked um, and people who um, society um, don't like who are on death row. These are victims in so many different ways, um, as I said, um, through poverty, um, discrimination, um, and many other factors. Um, but this is a great piece of work um, done by the National Law University. And the last comment I'm just going to make about that is, if you do get a chance to look at that report, even though we all know from our work the sort of tough things we see sometimes, the tortures that are being carried out are quite extraordinary. We're not talking about, you know, a beating down the back of the cell. We're talking about the sort of tortures that, you know, give you nightmares to read about them, let alone to undergo them. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a fantastic and important piece of research. And we, we, we may talk about it in questions if anyone's interested, but one of the things that we're looking at into the future uh, is targeted research in combination with universities like Monash, uh, and other universities where by producing good quality research we can deliver that to public uh, decision makers, MPs and so on in different countries which then changes the direction of the debate and necessitates uh, a, a fresh look at these kind of issues. Uh, so uh, well, I'll leave that there. We'll go to questions, Ramona. Well, um, what we're going to do is two of these mics have to go to the audience and you guys are going to share these mics for the answers. Um, there's a uh, you'd be aware that it's 50 years this year since we've had our last execution, but um, within our region, of course, many of the countries that are actively executing are within the Asian region. And Julian just mentioned that China is presumed to be at the head of that list, although the figures are hard to obtain. But also in Australia, we have many, many hundreds of thousands of students from those countries studying. Uh, in China, 108,000 last year at 30 universities. One of the major universities is Monash. Um, I'm pleased that you were able to speak to students at Monash yesterday. They could have been volunteers or they could have been law students. Um, but my question, probably not, you know, is what is the role of universities and Australia hosting hundreds of thousands of university students from overseas, uh, often from countries that are leading the world in executions. Now, I know it's been in the debate in the last few days, it's a topical issue, but I think there's an enormous responsibility for the Australian community and for the 30 universities that are hosting many of those uh, students from countries that are executing to educate them around uh, Western values and human, the, val the international values of the dignity of human life. Let's hear a response. Who's going to respond to that? If you're prepared to answer, I'll just hand it back to you. I thought maybe the visitors might not want to get stuck into that, but uh, I'll give it to you. Okay, well, um, I mean, I think, I think it's a really good question and I think that um, I think it's not so much about Western values, it's about understanding international human rights law um, and the current status of international human rights law and actually to talk about the death penalty, um, to talk about um, why countries have moved away from the death penalty and the lessons to be learned from our own experiences of having the death penalty, um, whether that's in Australia or the United Kingdom, whether that's to do with wrongful convictions, we can all talk about many, many cases of innocent people who have been executed, innocent people who have been sentenced to death, um, due process requirements, um, and I think that is a very important role to play. Um, so that the 
new generation of lawyers, the new generation of citizens, um, has a proper understanding of um, the death penalty as a human rights issue. Um, that the death penalty is not just the province of um, national criminal justice policy, um, but it actually um, invokes human rights principles at all different stages. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, of, of course I agree with all that. I think you could extend that to all institutions. Um, we're talking about uh, universities, we're talking about young people, but I think it's really about education, it's really about information, and, I, and certainly the discussions we have had in the past have been with governments, and including, for example, the UK government, who provide what, they, what, are, what are called criminal justice advisors to countries in the world, Commonwealth countries, because there's a natural connection there, um, to assist them in their criminal justice system and how to improve their prosecutions and so on. And we say, well, you must remember, doing that can also create a situation where somebody can be convicted and sentenced to death. Um, so I think it's institutions um, all over. But I think what we're really talking about here is education and we're talking about information sharing. And I would extend that to the, to the media as well. I mean, you're talking about um, students coming over from certain jur jurisdictions, but I think, for example, a lot of people see the media as providing information, but I think the role of the media is also to educate. And what we see in jurisdictions in which we operate, um, the stuff that you see in the media actually isn't information providing, it's just reporting. And I think, so getting institutions to play a role, whether it be students, whether it be um, um, governments, embassies working with criminal justice systems is, is very important. At the back there. Uh, I, the um, amount that you've done is extraordinary and let me compliment you, but um, given what's been happening in the Philippines, uh, I wonder whether you'd like to comment as to whether you've had a brief to help the situation there, because it seems to be an appalling situation that's happening in the Philippines. Shall I go first? Yeah. I completely endorse everything you say there. I think the problem, um, we, we work in so many jurisdictions. We work in Singapore, Malaysia. Um, we've never worked in the Philippines because, as Julian said, the death penalty had been abolished. And it was used as the model, really, on what needs to happen in um, Southeast Asia. Um, I think we need to be a little bit frank and clear that what is happening in the Philippines isn't... Um, the rule of law. It isn't judicial. What is, that, what is happening is extrajudicial killings. Um, so we all, have, as a community, as individuals, as governments, we have to do something and we have to be strong and protest about it. But I think the, what we mustn't do is put them into the brackets of other countries that we've been discussing, where it's about criminal justice reform, it's about um, developments and so on. So um, I agree, something needs to be done I, I haven't got the answers to what, other than, as I said, to try as a community to um, speak out against it. Um, I can add a couple of things to that. Uh, one of the lawyers who worked on the um, Bali 9 case was uh, Chris Ward, Dr. Chris Ward, who's a Sydney silk, and through a series of um, Connections. He was invited to go to the Philippines. Uh, uh, we were able to assist with all of that, and he wrote a substantial constitutional law advice on the um, unconstitutionality of the Philippines reintroducing the death penalty after it had signed this second optional protocol to the ICCPR. Uh, nobody has ever signed the uh, second optional protocol, which basically says we sign this and as a country we promise to work against the death penalty. That's what the document says. Singa uh, Philippines have done that. Uh, so we do have one of our network, if you like, working on that area. That, area, that opinion has been published now and it's a fantastic 20-page read. And if you want to really understand what's going on legally there, that's the place to start. Um, uh, we have been there, I've been there, Matt Goldberg's been there, and we're trying to work with people. Uh, but ultimately what Pervase is saying is the, the bottom line is it's, it's, it's chaotic. Uh, 
Um, Peter Norton, who's here, has written publicly into the Philippines many times, urging the leadership of the uh, Catholic Church to stand up and say more and be more courageous. Uh, and there is a shift going on in the Philippines, but to give you one example of how chaotic it is, the most, probably the most important institution, the, certainly from, from my outsider's perspective, what it looks like at least one of the most important institutions is the Commission for Human Rights. Uh, it, it's got some very courageous people and they speak up about the current issues. There's approximately 13,000 so-called extrajudicial killings in the last 16 months. Uh, the budget was passed several weeks ago. Uh, the budget for the Commission for Human Rights, all of its staff uh, was for the next 12 months is $20. So the government has just said, well, we're not listening to anyone who disagrees with us. We're defunding you, absolutely. Um, the law to reintroduce the death penalty was the first bill passed by the new regime in June of last year. Uh, it has stalled in the Senate. The Senate, strangely, for a country of 100 million people, only has 24 senators, and it, the bill is stalled there. We don't know where it's uh, going to go. Um, we can all pressure the people in Australia that we know who have decision-making roles in, in government or um, media and so on to say more and be tougher about the Philippines. Uh, I think there's a potential for the Philippines to turn into, it's already in trouble, but to actually go into an extremely bad situation. Um, okay. And at the front. Um, I'm interested in the five year or the three year rule that you've um, talked about earlier tonight, this idea that once a prisoner has spent a certain period of time on death row, it becomes unconstitutional. I'm interested to know whether you're concerned about or if you've seen um, countries more efficiently carrying out executions as a result of, of that rule. Um, the answer is no. Um, in the countries where we work, um, I mean, the way the five-year rule works is it's not an absolute rule, it's a yardstick. Um, but essentially, um, the Privy Council set out time limits um, or expectations for how long the, um, the appellate process should take, um, the second tier of appeal should take, the clemency process and any applications to international bodies, um, and as well as the clemency, as well as mercy hearings at the end of that process. Um, and um, in some cases it has been, you see governments moving expeditiously in particular cases, um, but generally it's a pretty tough time limit um, to meet. Um, there were concerns, I mean there are concerns about running some lit litigation in the US where prisoners can be held on death row for 30 years because a response to that particular um, litigation jurisprudence could be the cutting of certain appeals um, to speed cases along to make sure executions happen quickly. So each jurisdiction needs to decide for itself um, strategically um, whether there are any dangers associated to that particular um, style of litigation. But I think it's really, um, it's really a challenge in many respects to the death penalty itself. Um, the court is, um, if you read the judgment of the Privy Council, it uses language of the alternating um, anxiety and despair of being on death row for a number of years. Um, and I think that we would feel that you, that anxiety exists from day one of being on death row. So it is quite an abolitionist judgment um, in the reasoning um, of the court. Um, but the court can't, as we mentioned earlier, that the, the court cannot simply abolish the death penalty. Um, so they've just made it very difficult for the states to carry out the sentence. So it is, um, you have to make a judgment um, as lawyers on, um, with local lawyers. I mean, we don't make those decisions alone. Um, we work with local lawyers in Pratt and Morgan, we work with lawyers in Jamaica, um, and we try to make an educated decision as to what was best. Um, but I mean, the other way to look at it was in that particular case, Earl Pratt and Ivan Morgan, the two defendants, had faced three execution warrants had been on death row for 14 and a half years. I mean, on three occasions, they came 10 minutes from being executed. 
and the Privy Council said enough is enough. Um, it would just be wrong um, for them to face another ex potential execution. So I think you have to look at it um, around the facts of the particular case as well. We're just about out of time. I think we've got a last question here. Hey, it's a really basic question, but each time I see like a story of a really serious murder, a really serious case, I think I see a lot of people who are like, bring back the death penalty. I see these comments get a lot of support. Even with the Indonesian cases recently, I saw a lot of Australians saying it's their fault. They knew the laws. They should cop it. And as well, I see a lot of Filipinos as well. They're really supporting what's happening. So why do you think this attitude is so prevalent, which seems to be supporting executions in the first place? Um, I think, it, I think it's, a, it's a natural reaction. You see it in, in many jurisdictions. You see it everywhere. Um, um, at the culmination of a serious offence or a terrorist act, um, there are many people who call for um, um, the reintroduction of the death penalty or execution. Um, but what are we, I think the question for me there is, what are we really talking about? Are we just talking about retribution and revenge for something that's happened? Um, and if it is about retribution and revenge, you, there's no answer to that. If somebody says that I want, to, I want this person executed um, out of revenge and retribution for what they did, I don't have a problem with that as a, as a, as a point. Um, the question is, um, the existence of the death penalty or the reintroduction of the death penalty must be for something a little bit more than that. It must be, as a criminal justice policy issue, it has some kind of impact and some kind of effect. And... You know, we're often asked this question about, for example, well, what about somebody who's really done something terrible um, and, and, and they're rightly convicted um, and somebody wants to um, have them executed or kept in prison forever? I think we sometimes conflate the issue of criminal justice and what we're trying to achieve with the issue of the death penalty. Whatever, whatever jurisdiction you, you're from, um, you have to deal with crime and criminality and people must be punished. Some people have done things that are so bad, uh, or they may be so dangerous that they will never be released. But the point of the criminal justice system is that it has an element of punishment, it has an element of rehabilitation, and each case needs to be assessed differently. So I think that we've had this, certainly in the United Kingdom, the recent terrorist offences, you will hear people say um, the death penalty should be reintroduced. But it's, it's a reaction rather than a really a solution as to um, introducing something like that would mean that um, terrorist offences wouldn't happen or that crime would be reduced. So I think that sometimes we have to sort of just separate it and say, look, let's take the death penalty out of the equation. Let's talk about what we need to do to make sure people feel safer on the streets, to make sure terrorist offence do offences don't happen, rather than say it's because we, we don't have the death penalty or it's because we have the death penalty. And I think Julian wants to say something now. Yeah. Yes, you do, because you asked me to go over there, and then you said you did. <laughs> Remember? It's a good job he's not a witness. <laughs> I, 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 so, so we're winding up uh, in terms of the Q&A. I was saying I'll, I'll just speak for a minute or two when we wind up the Q&A. Well, it, if you look at your watch, you'll find that this My is... My watch is time. broken. I don't have one. So. <laughs> right. You have to believe me then. OK. Well, we're going to wind up the Q&A, and uh, we'll obviously be here for drinks afterwards, so everyone's welcome to chat if they want to. Um, uh, so the, 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 there are a few reasons why you're all here. One reason, a critical reason, is to brief you. Uh, my personal opinion is that because of historical events in 15 years and because of the nature of the legal profession in Melbourne, uh, we have a, a very significant role to play in our region in the next 10 or 15 years and there's plenty of people in the room here who will be doing that I expect and it's completely irrelevant to what I just said but a couple of the founders of Reprieve Australia are sitting here so put your hands up, put your hands up high, maybe you can say hello to them later, uh, Pia and Nick and Sue Brennan, Richard Burke founded Reprieve 15 years ago, thank you very much. Uh, so our region is and executing region. There are two areas in the world that execute, our region and the Middle East. Uh, I'm not attempting to enter the Middle East as, a as an area to do work, uh, and I think other people will have to do that in the foreseeable future, but we are working in quite a few 
countries in Asia in a small way. We have the connections in many of those countries to work in a much more significant way. The work that we are going to do is hopefully not too much of the kind of casework that you've seen us do in the past. We want to do that when necessary and as our guests do and as we do, we always work underneath the local lawyers. So if there were five cases or 50 cases that we'll be working on, uh, in every case it'll be the local lawyers doing that work with support from people like ourselves. And in fact, these guys, we haven't even touched this whole issue, they have hundreds of UK lawyers, QCs, barristers and solicitors, uh, and psychiatrists and psychologists and other experts on their payroll, all of whom get paid nothing. Uh, they're just volunteers and they, these guys are actually running um, at least a hundred cases, I think probably more, around the world with teams of lawyers like the people in this room assisting the local lawyers. So um, I know from knowing you that if we have that many cases, we actually can do that. Uh, hopefully we don't have to, but um, I'm hoping we can support more lawyers who are on the ground in uh, our regional countries who really need help. We also want to engage in the kind of research which changes countries. Again, we haven't even touched on it. Some of the research that these guys have generated in the past has been in-depth research with local institutes, think tanks, combining with scholars from England, say Oxford University, um, funded in various ways, leading to world-class research being produced, put into the hands of government ministers who then say, this is different to what we thought the people in our community thought. We're going to reassess our policy. So for instance, when you see the mandatory death penalty abolished in Malaysia in the foreseeable future for death for drug offences, it will be because of research which was commissioned four years ago uh, done by Malaysians with the help of people from Oxford and these guys, which local research showed that Malaysians do not support the mandatory death penalty for drug offences, even though politicians have spent 30 years saying they do. So it's going to change. There's lots of research that can be done like that, and we just have to get organised to do it. And that's going to be much more effective than any kind of megaphone diplomacy and so on. Well, I guess that's an oxymoron to say megaphone diplomacy. Uh, so, um, as you know, I always go around asking for money. It's just part of the way I operate. <coughs> if anyone thinks that's true, I'd be very disappointed. Uh, but we want you to understand what's going on. I expect to um, reprieve Australia and, and its smaller group to work in various ways with either some of you or many of you or many of the people you know. Um, we're transitioning now to setting up um, a situation where we employ a CEO and hopefully one or more researchers. We're obviously going to be working more with Monash University based on the discussions that I've had with the Dean and professors from Monash. Um, so one of, I'm not asking for money from all of you, it's, I, I just find frankly that very embarrassing. But for those of you who are interested in supporting us that way, uh, we really do want um, quite a bit more financial support so that we can transition into a more um, useful organisation. We know what people in quite a few countries would like to see happen. We can help that happen, but we can't continue to do it out of you know, out of hours, night times and weekends and so on. We need to have a, a small staff. Um, there's a lot to be done in Asia. We can do it. Uh, we're not going to change the world, but, you know, we can really bring about significant change in the jails and the prison cells and the police stations and the gallows in quite a few countries in Asia if we employ strategic work, which um, we need some funding for. And as you all know, and um, all of us in this room, if we're working on any of those cases, it's all pro bono. We've all always been pro bono, and if any of you are in these cases, you will always be pro bono. But there are some things which can't be pro bono, which is hiring um, CEO and researchers and so on. There's a whole lot of pamphlets out there, including, more interesting than any of the pamphlets, there's actually a front page article from The Economist about these two guys, which you'll really enjoy reading. Um, 
So thank you for coming. Uh, we, some, I, I, I won't tell you the name of this person. Someone very significant in our legal community said to me the other day, now, Melbourne should be the hub of this kind of work in, this, in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we should generate the connections, the interest, the research, the training. We can bring people like ourselves, but with less training, to Australia, work with them and train them. We have a, almost uniquely in this part of the world, we have a, a government that really wants to see us succeed in this kind of work. Um, so in, there, there are almost no countries in the world where people like us can ring up and speak to a minister or a, a head of a department and say, you know, do you want to work with us on this project in Australia? That's the attitude we now have. Australia is opposed to all executions everywhere without exception and openly says this at the United Nations now. So that's, you know, that's the environment we're working in. Almost probably no country in our region except New Zealand is working in a similar environment. So one of the things I want you all to think about, or some of you to think about, is um, supporting us financially. Uh, and there's material out the back uh, if that interests you. That's probably, I'm looking at Alex, have I said enough, Alex? I, I had another talk like this uh, yesterday and I got hammered for not saying it, probably not saying enough. Okay, I've said enough. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and thank you, Ramon. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Monash Law again, uh, Professor Brian Horrigan, for supporting Reprieve Australia. I believe there's something to drink and something to nibble on outside. And um, you can uh, perhaps uh, call out our guests, Julian McMahon, Parvez Jabbar and Saul Leafroyne, and uh, continue the conversation. Thanks for coming. Thank you.